Hi, everyone. Welcome back to The Art of Sales Company. It's excellent to have you here, as always. Thank you for watching. Uh, today, we got a little bit of an out-of-the-ordinary video because we have an extraordinary statement from Creative Assembly saying that they're going to add more content to the Shadows of Change DLC, uh, which they should. Uh, now, uh, that is for the larger community to decide. I'm not going to talk about other people's business practices. But what I have to say is that there are some major opportunities for uh, rework here. And what I want to do with today's video is go through some of the factions that are impacted by the Shadows of Change DLC and talk about what can change to uh, make it a better game, both in the form of faction mechanics as well as uh, unit and roster changes and maybe an addition or two here or there, uh, which they we know that they're going to be uh, making some major additions, but I think I've got some directions to steer some things. Now, uh, first, we're going to start off with Katarin, and she's going to represent the uh, main Kislev factions. So think uh, Katarin, Kostaltin, and Boris. And then we're going to go over to Mother Estankia, but I will reference her periodically throughout uh, this little Katarin talk here. So the first thing that is kind of weird with the Ice Court <coughs> uh, specifically is if we look at this uh, Frost Maiden thing. Uh, Frost Maidens and Ice Witches take multiple turns to train, and they are, are really powerful as far as their traits are concerned. I can take or leave the Ice and Frost, or uh, excuse me, Ice and Tempest. Tempest is obviously better than Ice, but uh, I don't think that anybody is going to argue that something like the shadow mage for Mother Estankia is anywhere comparable to an ice switch. Okay, like this this character is way better than an ice switch. The magic is better. Their mobility is better. Uh, it's just a better character. The only thing that is a little bit of a shortfall on these characters is that their traits kind of suck. So it's a balancing act. The thing that I find weird is that for me to increase Frost Maiden production, right, get more of these, I have to spend six turns or so training them. They come out with inferior magic, and to increase their capacity is up here. That is a tier five building, and it costs 10 grand. So for the Ice Court specifically, what I would say is that we could do something like the Sisters of Avalorn with uh, Alario. Shift all this down one tier. So... She gets access to Ice Guard with swords at uh, Tier 3, and then this is a Tier 4 building, and she can increase the Frost Maidens at a Tier 4. That is substantially better for just the Ice Court. Everybody else can deal with it as is, uh, but the other thing that really needs to change here that is really strange is we have to go through all this to get these Frost Maidens, right? But all we have to do to get these uh, better magic lores is just build a tier three building that costs five grand and only takes a couple turns to get to. So this could be rebalanced, I think. I think that this is fine for Mother Astankia. So we leave this as is for her or maybe do a similar thing to like the Skaven where they have a uh, two, three, and four building for uh, the triads and the gutter runners and all that sort of stuff. Uh, for everybody except for Eshin that gets it at one, two, and three. Uh, and I think there's an opportunity here to perhaps bifurcate this. So let's say just for the, for the sake of discussion that we don't shift the tiers of these buildings for the various factions, but um, maybe we leave this the same for Mother Astankia, but then we bifurcate it for everybody else. So Oxina and Ambushers at tier two, Tier 3, we get the Things of the Wood, and we'll say the Crappy Mage, the, uh, the, the, the Death Wizard, so the crappiest of them. And then at Tier 4, you unlock the Incarnate Elemental and the Good Mages, the Beast, and the Shadow Wizard. I think that that's a way that you could accomplish it, because right now, the, the leveling between these characters that are Chariot-based... Uh, missile chariot based and superior lores of magic to what the ice court can generate with its frost capacity is just weird 
The other problem with Kislev that they absolutely need to fix is access to Siege Attacker. So if we were to look at uh, Katarin here, she, the Legendary Lord, is going to have Siege Attacker. So you start with one army that can access Siege Attacker. But if we go into our roster here, where do you see it? You see it here, which is a level 4. We see it in the Incarnate Elemental, level 5. And then another tier 4 in the form of the Little Grom. That's it. So I look at it like this. This should be accessible earlier than tier 4. And you don't have to do anything to the way this is currently set up. You just take example the Skaven again. They have their really awesome siege attackers in the form of their major monsters. They have uh, the warp lightning cannons. They have the plague claw catapults, all that sort of stuff, right? Although I will say that the uh, plague claw catapults are available at tier three. Uh, but that's beside the point. If you need a siege attacker quickly and cheaply, then you use the warp grinder as the, as the Skaven. So all we need to do is add like a tier two or tier three siege attacker in here and make it something trashed here, right? It doesn't have to be a very good unit. It just needs to be a siege attacker that gets us off the ground. Because if you look at Kislev here, uh, you're going to start out with this these settlements. You're going to come down here. This is going to be a major settlement, right? Fort Jakova. Yeah, Fort Jakova, major settlement. You're then going to have to contend with Prague. Uh, that's going to be a major settlement battle. Uh, Fort Ostrock is now a major settlement. We've got Hell Pit up here, which is a major settlement. And then all this over here. Uh, no, that was part of Fort Ostrock. I forgot that they made that a, a level or a four settlement province, which was a good move. But if you're coming over here, you're going to go to war with Azazel. And he's at the Temple of Crack here, uh, Castle of Crack here. So it's going to be another siege attacker so you've got one army that can access siege attacker at the early stages of the campaign doing all that heavy lifting it makes it basically turns katarin into a ping pong ball she has to run down here and then she's going to run up here she's got a bing bing bada boom bada bong all the way up through here and your track for her is very settled because you have all these stresses you have to deal with if you could access siege attacker earlier than tier four then you wouldn't be doing all that and you could have a more free-flowing more sandbox campaign than is currently presented in uh, the current build of the game. I think that the other thing that can happen as far as uh, the roster is concerned, I like the Kislev roster as is. It could be built out a little bit more. I think that there's some opportunities, particularly with some of these hybrid units, to do some other things. They need more heroes. It becomes very bland very early. Look at like the vampire counts. Look at the Skaven. They got characters out the ass, man. So, I like the Patriarch. I like the Frost Maiden. I like these units that we've got. I like the characters that are currently built into the game. But I feel like we need some melee, some more melee specialist stuff going on here. And there are opportunities to do that where we just have another melee uh, capable uh, hero that does something other than the battle prayers, right? Like, I like the way that the Patriarch is currently set up. I like that we increase the capacity for uh, Patriarchs at level two. I think that's fantastic. Uh, so you can build a lot of these. But the armies end up looking like Lord, single hero, maybe two heroes. Let's change that up a little bit. Maybe make even um, an additional... Uh, melee hero that does something different than what the Patriarch does. Kind of like how you, the Skaven have a, um, a training individual and a, a casualty replenishment individual and then another melee lord that can do uh, both, right? Uh, or scaven it does scavenge and uh, has the ability to choose another line somewhere in there. Uh, and then maybe even do a ranged because Kislev is known for the ranged. Uh, they ha they could even do a, a horse based one, kind of like Orica is built, right? So there's there's some opportunity to build out the hero roster considerably uh, for Kislev here. Now let's switch over to a Mother Astankia campaign and uh, let's talk about the specific changes that I would make over there.
All right, Mother Stankia. First off, I want to say, actually, I really like the Hex system. I actually don't even dislike the supporter system over uh, on the Ice Court and Castalton, right? I don't think that that's a, a bad system, especially now that they've tweaked it, and I don't dislike this either, so I don't think that that really needs to change. However, the first most glaring problem for uh, Mother Stankia is her location. I actually am 100% okay with locking out all of these units. For those of you who haven't played Mother Stankia, she can't get Patriarchs, can't get uh, the main military buildings here, can't get this. Uh, I believe that she can go up this line. Uh, yeah, so this can be built in a province capital. She can still get access to this stuff, right? Uh, but she can't get this or any of uh, this stuff over here, right? So that makes it pretty punishing for her to be located on the other side of the map. Now, it's really easy if you use her hexes to get there in relatively short order, but that's a gimmick, okay? It's it's kind of like some of the unholy manifestations in the, uh, the demons. It's kind of gimmicky. Yeah, we're clear across the map, but we can just teleport there at any point in time. It's, it feels a little bit cheap to me. I think it would be better if we just located her a little bit closer and I understand that there was a lot going on over in that part of the world, and there's going to be a lot going on in the uh, further DLCs uh, with that region, and this area needed a little bit of love. Okay, I'm fine with that. But the uh, this does not need to be the character that we did that with. We could have done this with something else. You could have dropped another Skaven Legendary Lord over here for for to, to build the area out. I don't think that putting Mother Estankia this far away from Kislev is the way to go. Now, uh, as far as the lockouts are concerned, I'm okay with the lockouts. Now, having looked at this now, I think I found the solution for Kislev's siege attacker problem. Uh, we simply make it so that these, roll these bears, the feral ice bear and feral bears, roll those into the, uh, the main Kislev faction, might as well, why not? And uh, make these, one of these, have Siege Attacker or something like that. Something cheap, something easy to generate the Siege Attacker, and then you're off to the races. Because, again, uh, there is the same problem with Siege Attacker not being available in this army as well. We can't get it anywhere except for here and here. We can't even get the little Groms until we meet somebody else. So... Uh, Mother Astankia is hurting on the siege attacker yet again and again. It causes her to be a ping pong ball. She basically comes down this way, comes across that way, and then she has to go up north. It's it's a forced path because we cannot generate siege attacker any other way. Uh, and then the other thing that we need to talk about as far as Mother Astankia is concerned that is most glaring and in your face is if I go in here to recruit a lord, we have boyars. What, what the heck? I mean... This just feels, and I think everybody will agree, incomplete. The, they basically rushed this through and did not complete this. Why on earth do we have access to boyars? We can't access all of the unit roster until we meet the rest of Kislev and form an alliance with them. But we can recruit their princes? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. So there should be a hag lord accessible, uh, for recruitment that has access to maybe some different lores. And this is where you can integrate the lore of hags. Like we don't need to come up, don't necessarily need to come up with a new hero of hags, but this is where perhaps we could come up with a lore of hags for uh, the uh, lord only. And then the lord can also have access to the other types of magic and you could probably put some more lores in there too kind of like the empire has access to a whole bunch of lores so there's there's an opportunity there uh, and then of course the overflow as far as the other stuff as far as melee lords and stuff like that are concerned uh, some of those could be maybe woodsman kind of people that you integrate into both factions for having access to melee heroes because again right now uh while I like the fact that uh, our patriarchs are locked out, it makes sense that Ostankia does not have 
access to the patriarchs, uh, that leaves her high and dry on everything else. And I understand that we're trying to force the this direction on these particular unit types. Got it. Uh, but this needs to be substantially more built out. It needs to emphasize a broader base of units for uh, this type of Kislev build than what is going on over there. Now it just feels super limiting instead of different. And that's what I would say about Mother Astankia. Let's move on to Sinch. We're just going to use Kairos for this because the changes that need to be made to the Changeling are very simple. And that is that the Changeling needs nerfed. The reason that the Changeling's campaign is uninteresting is because he is undefeatable. I mean, in the most literal sense, if you do everything correctly, it's pretty hard to lose a campaign in Total War Warhammer 3. But there is zero challenge to uh, the Changeling whatsoever. It is literally a curb stomp campaign. That is all it is. It is, it is even worse than say, what I would say is the strongest curb stomp campaign prior to the Changeling, which is Ica Claw. It, it, Ica Claw at least has some challenges that you have to undertake, and he isn't invulnerable. The Changeling is essentially invulnerable. You can't even intentionally lose that campaign. So uh, what I would say is that making the Changeling vulnerable would be a good way to make that campaign more interesting. As far as the mechanics are concerned i don't have a problem with most of the mechanics of the changeling i just think that it needs to be harder and he needs to be vulnerable that's what i would say about the changeling as far as kairos is concerned there are some things that that can be done with kairos that are relatively simple changes first of all we need more monsters in here okay uh, we need every single one of these should sprinkle something else in here. We can, you could even do it with the spawn. Um, so you could do different types of mutated spawn. It would be really easy to uh, change the way that uh, the, the roster currently works. Uh, and that would be a good way to uh, sprinkle more uh, anti-large in here because the biggest problem with Kairos right now is that he has very little anti-large and it comes in the form of this guy right here. Uh, he is anti-large. Uh, our next anti-large is going to be up here at tier four, right? With the halberds. Yep. Anti-large. Uh, none of these are obviously anti-large. Um, Furies obviously aren't. Uh, this is anti-large, right? So we're looking at our only choice for anti-large stuff. This anti-infantry, right? Yeah. Uh, the only choices that we have for anti-large stuff in the roster at an early stage are the uh, spears. And uh, that's, that's not good, okay? So we can sprinkle a lot of anti-large... Is this anti-large? Yeah, okay, I lied. Uh, these suck, though. Okay, let's just be honest. They, they, they really suck, and it has to do with the, the flying units and how they attack things. Uh, I like that they have anti-large capability at an early stage, but we need more uh, ground units that are capable of anti-large. And I think that if you sprinkled in uh, maybe a variant of uh, a bunch of variants of spawn, that would help. And then there's some more opportunity for monsters in here. We could use another big monster. Uh, I understand that we got the Mutilus Vortex Beast, but as far as my understanding of the lore is concerned, uh, that's supposed to be an undivided character, not a Zinch character. So I also know that we got the Cockatrice. Where is that at? Yeah, uh, that was a fantastic addition. I really like how this thing works, uh, and I, I thought that was a great thing to do. Uh, however, for the package of the DLC, I think we could sprinkle in some more uh, variants in here uh, of, variant, uh, of various monsters. So I think we've exhausted what we can do with the flamers, uh, but maybe change the way the screamers work. Uh, I think we've ex overextended what we can do with the horrors. Um, maybe uh, some different variants of uh, mutated chaos warriors. 
uh, or multiple variants of the Zangors. Where are the Zangors at? Divide this out. So right now, what we have, uh, and this would add some some variety into the the build. Right now, if you uh, if you look at this, we have this one building does Marauders. Why on earth would you get Marauders when you can get Zangors, right? And Forsaken. So divide this out. I know that what they're trying to do here is like Demon, Mortal, right? Got it. Divide this out again, right? So this is going to be your uh, your men-based units. So you'd have Marauders... Uh, Chaos Warriors, and then uh, your Chosen, right? And you could probably even restructure this, maybe not make it a Tier 4 building. So divide this out. You could have Mutated Beastmen, and then you could have a whole bunch of different types of Zangors, right? And then you could have another building that is Mutated Men, which is where you get your spawn and your uh, maybe some Mutated Chaos Warriors, some Mutated... Uh, chosen like there there are lots of opportunities if you just split this out because right now it's, it feels very confined and uh, there's enough going on with the settlement types that you're already going to have to specialize your your individual settlements with zinch as is which brings me to the next concern that i have for zinch and that is that zinch does not feel like the trickster Okay, it, it does not feel that way when I go through there. It's very, very basic when it comes to, like, their economy, for instance. I feel like Zinch's economy should be more cheesy than it is. Right now, it's very simple. You build this building, and you make sure that your wins are high. Uh, I, I will give praise. I really like this system. This is fantastic. Keep this. Do not change that whatsoever. I, I really like that ability. I also like the changing of the ways and what they've done with this. I feel like there should be more options. I feel like there should be two more rows of things that you can do on the campaign map with this. Uh, is One of them should be extract money from, <laughs> you know, force extort. I don't know what it is. Uh, there should be more ways to make money as Kairos. Kairos, don't get me wrong, can be very rich, but when we're talking about the economy of Zinch, it does not feel like a cheesy, trickstery type of play. It feels like a very generic, I would say even blander than high elf uh, economy, because there's just there's no exploits to be to be undertaken as Zinch. And I think that that is the main shame when it comes to uh, how it is currently set up. So what I would say is in closing today, across the board, there should be more legendary heroes. Uh, the work's already done. Like you, you basically just pick them out of the lore, give them some artwork, and put them in one of the categories and give them a, a quirk here or there and turn them into a legendary hero. I feel like that'll help build out some stuff. And uh, the question that I have is whatever happened to FLC stuff, uh, because I think you got an opportunity here to address some some other things. You would, in Warhammer 2, for instance, you would get the title stuff, and then you would get a free-for-everybody, you know, lord or two, right? Uh, bring that back, but use it not necessarily like in this case, where you've got a, a one for Zinch, one for Kislev, one for Cafe, and uh, then you got to have a FLC for a Lord for each of them. No, don't do that. Uh, the, do your title stuff and then pick somebody else somewhere else that could use some love uh, and add a character to, uh, I, I, I don't know, somebody else who needs some additional build out and maybe change a little bit of mechanic here or there to, uh, to add that in. I think that that's a good opportunity to make the DLC feel broader than the three lord pack offer a fourth lord that's flc with the update and put it somewhere else than uh what's going on because i think that um like with ostankia like that area needed some love because nothing's been done over there for a while and you put ostankia there and it 
had the impact of giving the area some love. However, it ha- it's, it feels out of place. So if you had had a fourth lord that was an FLC lord from whoever, you could have stuck it over there and gave the area some love. You know what I mean? So that's what I would say about that. And then uh, to everybody who's like, hey, Kurt, you forgot to talk about Cathay. Uh, what needs to change for Cathay? And my response to uh, what is going on in this DLC for Cathay is that uh, Cathay is a, a faction that should not exist in the game. The, the This is a something the Games Workshop came up with to pander to uh, political uh, affiliations. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, they could delete Grand Cathay from the game and it would not hurt my feelings at all, except for we no longer would have a punching bag for all the factions that everybody actually wants to play. So, fuck Grand Cathay. Bye. <laughs>